podcast. Welcome to the Just Thinking Podcast with hosts Daryl Harrison and Virgil Walker, bringing you cultural apologetics as well as social issues from a biblical worldview. This is the Just Thinking Podcast. Let's think. All right, we're back. It's another edition of the Just Thinking Podcast. I am Virgil Walker. And I am Daryl Harrison. What's going on in Soonerland, Omaha? <laughs> man, man I, 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 listen, man. I, I appreciate I appreciate the Sooner shout out, man. But man, that was a incredibly depressing outcome to a game, man. I was really heartbroken over what happened. I saw that score yesterday, man, and I actually I was listening to it on Sirius uh, XM, mm-hmm. and I was listening to the game, you know, heard the final score, and I started to hit you up, but I said, <laughs> nah. <laughs> I'm not going to do I, my boy like that because he's probably, you know, he, he's he's shedding enough tears as it is. Yeah, I, and, was, I was definitely in mourning, uh, so, that's so for I, sure. I, 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 I had mercy on you, bro, yesterday. I showed you a little bit of grace. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, I didn't hit you up yesterday. I said nah, I'll just wait till I'm on the mic with him uh, uh, today. So he, so I'm like, well, there goes there goes his national championship hopes, right? <laughs> bro, it's a it's a rebuilding year, man. It's a rebuilding I'm year. Like, man, you're you're Sooners, bro. Like what? And I, I I don't even have words. Three quarters of three, well, two and a half quarters of really really decent play. And then all of a sudden the wheels fell off, man. I have no idea what happened, man. So, yeah, well, I, you know, I was, I was thinking, I was like, man, do I do my normal greeting? Do I do my normal Omaha greeting, or do I say something a little bit more mournful, a little more despondent? You know, that's be that's befitting the occasion, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Man, I, I tell you what, I, I, it, this is a early, you know, it, I mean, if if ever you get to where you you begin to idolize and and lift up uh, sports in a in a way that that you shouldn't. Man, God has a a really great way to humble you as your team loses. Indeed, that's for sure. indeed. Yeah, and, and uh, you guys lost at home, right? That was a home game for you guys, right? I, don't even remind me, man. That's the heartbreak <laughs> of it all, man. That's that's the heartbreak of it all. It was at home. I mean, there's, I mean, the, the sense of pride of, of of what they do in Norman should be there to the degree that those players don't ever let that happen. So. Well, bro, I just wanted to rib you a little bit on that, man. But it's good to be back behind the mic with you, bro, again yeah. for another episode of the Just Thinking Podcast, man. How you feeling? I feel, I feel good, man. I, it, busy, busy, busy. I mean, you you know the drill. We, we're everywhere right now and just doing what we do and having incredible opportunities, man, to, to, to talk to different people, to do podcast interviews and the like, and... Um, Man, it's been crazy, but but uh, man, it's always good to to get on the microphone and and get a chance to chop up these issues, these topics, these subjects uh, with you. And and here's the thing that I know I I, I was I'll tell you this I was at church um, today and and I had quite a few people who had, who saw the topic that we were going to cover, the ground that we were going to cover, and uh, bro, it, it's incredible how so many people are are kind of waiting to hear our take on cultural issues because they know that we're going to operate from an incredibly biblical perspective. So, yeah, I was looking forward to getting with you, man. Yeah, I'll tell you, the topic we're addressing uh, today is a familiar one. I mean, we were right here behind these same microphones a couple months ago Mm -hmm. doing an episode that we titled George Floyd and the Gospel. And here we are again. Here we are again. This episode we're releasing is rather a special episode we titled this one Breonna Taylor and the Gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we kind of stuck with that original theme because whether it's George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, some of the same situations and circumstances and elements uh, are common in these two incidents, but the Gospel addresses this issue as it did the George Floyd issue. So mm-hmm. um, we said, hey, let's just stick with the standard title because that's what we do. We bring an issue up against the Gospel the word of God, and we try to exposit it accurately so that our listeners can understand and be encouraged that, yeah, there is a biblical worldview that you can have on issues like this. So here we are again, 
same um, um, same elements, same themes, same doctrines, uh, same principles and precepts apply mm -hmm. in this Breonna Taylor situation as applied to the George Floyd situation. There's really nothing different here other than um, um, the victim. Um, we have police involved in this situation as well. Uh, so hopefully this episode, we can uh, provide some encouragement, some objective uh, clarity to the fog that's uh, surrounding this situation. So that's why we're here. Breonna Taylor and the gospel, man. You want to tee this one up for us, uh, Omaha? Yeah, yeah, let yeah. our audience know what we're dealing with here. Yeah, let, let me do that. For those, for those, if, I mean, you, you'd have to be under a rock not to know about the Breonna Taylor issue and kind of what's going on. But with that said, Breonna Taylor, 26-year-old black woman, she was fatally shot uh, by Louisville Metro Police Department, LMPD. The officers were Jonathan Mattingly that were involved were Jonathan Mattingly, Brett Hankinson, uh, and Miles Cosgrove. This happened on March 13th. Uh, of 2020, um, the the, uh, the the white it says the the white officers entered her apartment uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, executing a search warrant. The officers knocked before forcing entry, but how or if the officers announced their identity before forcing entry is in dispute. Taylor's boyfriend Kenneth Walker uh, thought that there that there were intruders uh, entering the premises and fired a gun at them, hitting Mattingly Officer Mattingly in the leg. Uh, the officers fired a total of 32 shots in return. Walker uh, wasn't wounded, but Taylor was hit by six bullets in the hallway inside her apartment, and she died. Uh, Hankinson was fired by the LMPD on June 23, 2020, for blindly firing through the covered patio door at door window of, of Taylor's apartment, according to Police Chief uh, Robert Schroeder. Uh, on September 15th, the city of Louisville, this is interesting, the city of Louisville agreed to pay Taylor's family $12 million and reform police practices. And now where, where we are to date is on September 23rd, a state grand jury uh, indicted Hankinson, uh, not for Taylor's death, but on three counts of wanton endangerment for endangering a neighbor with his shots. The two other officers involved in the raid were not indicted. And so there, there's a lot more to this story, and we'll unpack it as we go. But that, that kind of at least tease us up with what's taken place, where we are, and kind of what's, what's happened. One of the things that, that I will say uh, about this, Daryl, that was difficult, man. As I as I poured through, uh, you know how we do. I mean, even even though it's a freestyle episode, I mean, we we spend quite a bit of time looking at news. You know, walking through all of the data and the information. Uh, I I I easily, I think, in preparation for this, logged at least six eight hours uh, in prep for for what I knew we would talk about today. Um, but but at, at what was difficult to do was to try to identify news that was uh, that, that didn't have a, a bias slant to it. I, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Even, even in this, this particular uh, news article, which actually came out of, I try when I'm doing research like this to go to the most local news uh, uh, outlet that I right. could. And so, mm -hmm. so this, this, this is from, from Louisville, uh, uh, an outlet from New Louisville. But even, even with that, in, in the news story, it says white officers entered her apartment as, as if they're, as if their 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 ethnicity mattered, right? Or 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 a black woman was shot. I mean, I, I get I get that from a standpoint of of identification, of who she was. But but it, it's difficult to find unbiased uh, news reporting that can give you just just kind of the facts without without you know without slanting a narrative. Yeah, I understand that. You know, you you in that, in that piece that you mentioned, that news source that you did find, they identified the uh, um, ethnicity of the officer by saying a white police officer mm -hmm. entered. Uh, and, and in saying that and using that wording, it's as if they are already are incorporating into uh, the rest of the article, the rest of that report, a narrative that there was already an ethnic bias built into the officers entering the apartment. Yeah. Uh, now I appreciate you setting the stage and giving a little bit of background on why we're here, that what happened in that incident, what it was, who was involved. Uh, now, now having said that though, I do want to say that our purpose in this episode of the just thinking podcast is not to rehash what happened. It right. is not to rehash what happened. 
It is not to re-adjudicate the uh, uh, issues that are being uh, processed through the court system, through the legal system. That is not the reason why we're here today. We're, we're, we're here to apply a biblical lens to what has already happened. Okay, not to regurgitate it, not to re-prosecute it. Uh, that's not why we're here. Okay, now having said that, I just want to get that clear because right. I don't, I don't know what people's expectations of us are, who may be looking forward to listening to this episode. But I just want to set set some parameters right there as to establish what what our purposes are. You and you and I, Omaha, for being behind the microphone today and talking about this, what our purposes are and what they're not. Okay, so I just want to make that clear. Yeah. Now, having said that, the first thing I want to do is express my sincere condolences to the family of Breonna Taylor. OK, and I say that on, on behalf of uh, Omaha as well. Mm-hmm. In the same way, Omaha, that you and I emphasize in the episode we did a few months ago on George Floyd in the gospel. I want to emphasize here that our condolences to the family of Breonna Taylor have nothing at all to do with the ethnicity of that she possessed, okay? Her ethnicity has nothing to do with this, okay? Our condolences to Breonna Taylor's family are rooted and grounded in the fact that regardless of the circumstances that placed Breonna Taylor in that apartment on the night she was killed, the fact remains that she was an image bearer of God, okay? As are we all. So again, on behalf of everyone on the Just Thinking Podcast team, I want to convey our heartfelt condolences and sympathies to the family of Breonna Taylor on, uh, uh, on her death. Now, having said that, Omaha, I can't help but think about Galatians 1-4, okay, where the Apostle Paul says that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, okay? That's one of many texts that came to my mind as we reflect on this Breonna Taylor incident. Okay, this indeed is an evil world in which we are living today. I don't know that we as Christians really appreciate that reality to the degree that, to the degree that we should. That word "evil" in Galatians one verse four is describing not only a world in which bad things happen. Okay, that's not what that word means. Okay, so when we when we read in, in, in Galatians one four that Christ came to rescue us from this present evil age. That word, e- that word evil is not just talking about, hey, hey, yeah, bad things happen. No, it's describing a world, okay? That, world, that word evil in Galatians 1.4 is describing a world that is morally and ethically corrupt by nature, okay? By nature, this world is morally and ethically corrupt by nature. And, and, and that this world is inherently evil is why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 21, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, that was Romans 8 verses 19 to 21. Now, there are two words in that passage of scripture that I just read that I don't want our listeners to gloss over Omaha. And those two words are in hope. Okay, in hope. Paul says that God subjected this world to futility in hope that it will be set free from its slavery to corruption. And we know that one day it will be set free. Okay, but those two words in hope. Bring to my mind the great 19th century Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who in his sermon titled Seeing God's Goodness Here, which he preached on August 1st, 1867, said this, quoting Charles Spurgeon, quote, we all know that this world is a very unpromising field for faith. According to our varied experiences, we must all subscribe to the declaration that this earth is more or less a veil of tears, that it is not our rest, for it is polluted. There are too many thorns in this nest for us to abide comfortably in it. This world is under the curse, so it still bringeth forth thorns and thistles 
and in the sweat of our face do we eat our bread until we return to the earth out of which man was first taken. Were this world really to be our home, it would be a terrible fate for us. If we were always to live in this huge penal settlement, it would be sad indeed for us to know that we had continually to dwell where the shadow of the curse ever lingers and where we have only the shadow of the cross to sustain us under it, unquote. I love that Spurgeon uh, described this uh, corrupt world as a huge penal settlement. I love that description and that we live in a world that is enslaved to corruption challenges us, I believe, as professing believers in Jesus Christ to understand the evil that occurs in this world through the objective truth of the word of God and not through our own subjective epistemological perspectives and sentiments. OK, now I say that because in situations such as the one involving Breonna Taylor, there are no winners. OK, there are no winners. There are only losers. All right. Anything you want to add to what I just said, Omaha? Yeah, the, quite quite a bit, man. I, I want to go back to the last thing you said first, and and kind of start there. And by by responding to to the fact that we live in this fallen and broken world, the hope that we have as believers uh, is knowing that that Christ at the end at the end of time at the eschaton will make all of these things new right that that the, the only the only thing that we can look forward to as we as we navigate this life with all of the issues that we run into with all of the the heartbreak that we encounter with all the sadness of death that we encounter is that we who do indeed believe in Christ uh, will experience a hope in him in fact revelation 21:4 uh, reminds us of the new heaven and new earth that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away. Uh, I, I think it's important to bring to bear um, the, the, the message of the gospel. I mean, this is this is the this is Brianna Taylor in the gospel. We've got to bring the gospel into conflict with the mm-hmm. with the pain and the suffering and the struggle that we see as a result of the fallen condition mm-hmm. uh, in in which we live. And so I think that that scripture is important for us uh, to consider. I, I want to echo what you what you did, man, in, in the same sentiment. Um, and the way that we addressed it when when George when we did the George Floyd in the gospel episode, the ending of any human life uh, is a reminder of the fallen, sin-filled world in which we live. And the manner in which life ends uh, is irrelevant to the fact that a, a, an image bearer of God is, is no longer here with us. Uh, I really was encouraged. I, one of the things I watched, Daryl, I watched the, uh, the Attorney General, uh, Daniel Cameron, and mm-hmm. his full, full statement uh, of, of the grand jury decision. Uh, he, he said the following. I think it bears repeating because I was really encouraged uh, by what he said. So I want to quote some of the section of what, of what he shared. He said this. He said, quote, I want, I want to once again publicly express my condolence. He said, every day this family wakes up to the realization that someone they loved is no longer with them. There's nothing I can offer today to take away the grief and heartache this family is experiencing as a result of losing a child, a niece, a sister, and a friend. What I can provide today, he said, are the facts which my office has worked long and hard to uncover, to analyze, and scrutinize since accepting this case in mid-May. I urge everyone listening today not to lose sight of the fact that a life has been lost, a tragedy under any circumstance, end quote. There was a lot more that that he shared in his opener, but I I just thought uh, as he began to kind of unpack all of the facts, most m- many of those facts would 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 leave someone you know upset from an emotional standpoint. I, I thought setting the tone up front by by acknowledging this this person, uh, Brianna Taylor, who uh, was cared for, was loved, uh, was was it was indeed a, a an image bearer of God, deserving of distinct value, dignity, and worth. I thought setting that up up front and, and acknowledging the tragedy of the situation was was the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for saying that, Omaha. Now, let me dig into where I want to focus. This is a lane that I want to be in right now. And I want to tee this up by saying, you know, notwithstanding everything that I've said to this point, okay, notwithstanding anything that I've said to this point in this episode, Omaha, I want to direct the remainder of my commentary to the individuals out there, especially those who profess to be Christian, okay, 
who are demanding quote unquote justice for Breonna Taylor, but who in reality only want vengeance and revenge. Okay. I'm talking about so-called Christians who are motivated not by our desire for the truth, but whose indignation is rooted in ethnic prejudice and hatred solely on the basis that Breonna Taylor was black and the police officer who shot her is white. Mm -hmm. I want to say to them right now, unequivocally, you are not Christians. You're not Christian. In fact, you should strongly consider referring to yourself by some other moniker because you are not modeling the way of Jesus Christ. Okay. What you are is a pharisaical hypocrite. If you were honest with yourself and more importantly, honest with God, you, you would concur that that pharisaical hypocrite would be a much more appropriate moniker for you because you're just one of those whitewashed tombs that Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 23 verses 27 and 28, where he said this, he said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That was Jesus in Matthew 23 verses 27 and 28. So along those lines, I'm talking to professing Christians out there. I don't really care about the hypocrisy of unbelievers. Okay. I fully expect unbelievers to be hypocrites, but a Christian hypocrite should be an oxymoron because the scripture declares that truly regenerate believers have the mind of Christ. That is first Corinthians two 16. And to have the mind of Christ is to not be a hypocrite so as to lie to yourself about who you truly are. But the fact is, Omaha, there are a lot of liars out there who are professing to be Christian. They purport to want justice in situations like the one involving Breonna Taylor, when what they actually want in their heart of hearts is not the kind of justice that is grounded in the impartial due process of law, mm -hmm. but they want a quote unquote justice that is biased, prejudicial and vengeful. They are liars. Those people are liars and no liar is satisfied with the truth because the truth doesn't get them what they want. Mm -hmm. now, now I say that in light of what the apostle John says in first John chapter four, verse 20, if someone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar for the one who does not love his brother who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Okay. So I, I, I know I'm probably upsetting a lot of people right now, but the lane I want to stay in in this, in this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast Omaha is to address the hypocrites out there who are clamoring for quote unquote justice for Breonna Taylor when they know mm -hmm. in their hearts that their motive is wrong. Thoughts, man? Man, I, I, I totally agree on, on a number of different levels. It's been interesting to witness how people are responding, particularly people who call themselves believers, right? I, 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 um, I think about Romans ch uh, chapter 16, verse 17. It says, I urge you, brothers, watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles that are contrary to the teaching which you have learned and to turn away from them. As we're, wa as we're watching people respond, one of the things that I'm noting are, 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 are that so-called believers are responding not on the basis of objecting to facts, but they're, mm. uh, they're but they're responding on a, on the basis of their emotion, and I think it goes to what you said. They by doing so, they expose their motivation. Right. Uh, but by, by doing so, they they expose their true heart condition, which is linked more times than not more closely with their ethnicity mm -hmm. than with than actually with the truth or the facts of, of, of the case. In fact, uh, the uh, the attorney general uh, mentioned, you know, a, about the fact that people are going to connect with emotion and, and how easy that is to do. But but he really he really pressed upon them that those who are part of the grand jury had the opportunity to look at and listen to. All of the facts, and it was not he, but that that the jury themselves concluded the decision that was mm -hmm. that was rendered in this instance. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what's what's being argued? At least those who either jump on a microphone, jump into a video, uh, find their find their their favorite you know tweet on on Twitter or or, or post something in, in 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 that way. What we're finding is they're not objecting to the facts of the case. 
Right. Their their objections are directly related to the ethnicity of the person involved in the shooting and mm-hmm. the person who was who was who was killed in this instance, Breonna Taylor. You know, Omar, you mentioned the Kentucky Attorney General by the name of Daniel Cameron. Mm-hmm. And to me, you know, even after the Attorney General having presented evidence to a grand jury, now a grand jury is larger in number than your standard juror, jury. Uh, normally, uh, your standard jury trial is going to be composed of 12 jurors, okay? 12 jurors of your peers, okay? In the grand jury, though, you've got a minimum of 16 up to 23 individuals, okay? Mm-hmm. So even having presented evidence to a grand jury, the uh, attorney general, the grand jury, determined that there was insufficient evidence to charge the police officers involved in the Breonna Taylor shooting with murder, okay? But we got some bloodthirsty Christians out there who are still calling for the officers to be charged with murder, even Mm -hmm. after due process, as you pointed out. The evidence was presented to the attorney general. The attorney general presented it to the grand jury. The grand jury determined that there wasn't sufficient evidence to charge the police officers with the, char- with the charges that these rabid, bloodthirsty so-called Christians out there wanted them to be charged with. And on that note, I want to take a moment right here at Omaha to, to educate some of those bloodthirsty individuals about how a grand jury works, okay? Because I'm thinking that some of them may not uh, be necessarily totally fluent on how a grand jury works, okay? So I want to quote from the website of the offices of the United States Attorneys, Okay. Here is how a grand jury works. Quote, after the prosecutor studies the information from investigators and the information they gather from talking with the individuals involved, the prosecutor decides whether to present the case to the grand jury. When a person is indicted, that is when a person is charged, he is given formal notice that it is believed that he committed a crime. The indictment contains the basic information that informs the person of the charges against him. For potential felony charges, a prosecutor will present the evidence to an impartial group, an impartial group of citizens called a grand jury. Witnesses may be called to testify. Evidence is shown to the grand jury and an outline of the case is presented to the grand jury members. The grand jury listens to the prosecutor and witnesses and then votes in secret on whether they believe that enough evidence, not enough emotion, enough evidence exists to charge the person with a crime. A grand jury may decide not to charge an individual based upon the evidence. No indictment would come from the grand jury. All proceedings and statements made before grand jury are sealed, meaning that only the people in the room have knowledge about who said what about whom. The grand jury is a constitutional requirement for certain types of crimes, meaning it is written in the United States Constitution. Listen to this last part. So that a group of citizens who do not No, the defendant can make an unbiased decision, can make an unbiased decision about the evidence before voting to charge an individual with a crime. Unquote. All that was from the website of the offices of the United States attorneys. Now, conversely, I want to read from the website of the Cornell University Law School. Okay, Cornell is a, a prestigious Ivy League institution. Uh, And I want to read the following directly from the Cornell Law School website. Quote, the history of the grand jury is rooted in the common and civil law, extending back to Athens, pre-Norman England, and the Assisi of Clarendon, promulgated by Henry II. The right seems to have been first mentioned in the colonies in the Charter of Liberties and Privileges of 1683, which was passed by the first assembly permitted to be elected in the colony of New York. Included from the first in James Madison's introduced draft of the Bill of Rights, the provision elicited no recorded debate and no opposition. To quote James Madison, quote, 
The grand jury is an English institution brought to this country by the early colonists and incorporated in the Constitution by the founders. There is every reason to believe that our constitutional grand jury was intended to operate substantially like its English progenitor. The basic purpose of the English grand jury was to provide a fair method for instituting criminal proceedings against persons believed to have committed crimes. Grand jurors were selected from the body of the people and their work was not hammered, hampered rather, by rigid procedural or evidential rules. In fact, grand jurors could act on their own knowledge and were free to make their presentments or indictments on such information as they deemed satisfactory, unquote. That was James Madison. Now, still continuing from the Cornell University Law School. Despite its broad power to institute criminal proceedings, the grand jury grew in popular favor with the years. It acquired an independence in England free from control by the crown or judges. Its adoption in our Constitution as the sole method for preferring charges in serious criminal cases shows the high place it held as an instrument of justice. And in this country, as in England of old, the grand jury has convened as a body of laymen. Listen to this. A body of laymen free from technical rules, acting in secret, pledged to indict no one because of prejudice. <clears throat> pledged to indict no one because of prejudice or to free no one because of special favor. Unquote. <coughs> Excuse me. I was from the Cornell University Law School. Now, given that background on how a grand jury operates, here's the thing, Omaha. That's not what many people want, including some Christians out there. They right. don't want a process that's absent of prejudice and favoritism. Take that last sentence in the Cornell University Law School section on grand jury. It said the grand juries are pledged to indict no one because of prejudice. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are Christians out there who don't want that. Right. They, they, they want the exact opposite of that. And yet they have the nerve to call it justice, which is precisely why they are hypocrites. You can't call it justice when what matters to you is not the truth, mm -hmm. but the skin color of the victim and the offender. Right. I mean, I mean, you take it. Attorney General Daniel Cameron is the first black person to be independently elected to statewide office in the 228 year history of the state of Kentucky. And yet he's still being vilified, especially by many blacks for having the temerity to abide by the oath, the oath of office, which he swore to. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you explain that, bro? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you and I, you and I both unfortunately know far too well how that works. Right. It, regardless of the fact that, that that justice is desired on the basis of skin color, once once the the verdict is rendered, or, or once the once the decision of the grand jury is rendered, um, the issue of of his race is is null and void. In other words, I mean, he, he's already in a place where you know he he's being considered a, a sellout, a, a coon. You know, all all of the things that get get said about someone once they've they've done, in, in my estimation what they should do, which is to, to uphold the law mm -hmm. uh, and, and, to, and to adjudicate the, the, the issue on the basis of the evidence. During his press conference, he said, I don't know how many times, he was asked what he thought, he was asked what he felt, he was asked uh, you know, as a black man what his, what his feelings were. And he said, my job is not to feel, my job is, my job is to present all of the evidence available so that the grand jury can come to a crystal clear decision about this issue. I want to read, I want to read again from part of his statement. And my, my, my reason for doing this is, is again, I, I do want to stay in line with what, what you laid out, uh, Daryl, at the outset, which is our, our goal is not to adjudicate the case. And, right. and, and so my, 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 my goal in reading the, this portion of, of his statement is, is simply to show you on the basis of what you just said, which I think as you've just laid out for our audience, for those who are listening to the Just Thinking podcast, you've laid out probably for the first time what a grand jury actually is, what, right. how, how it's actually made up, 
how it actually functions and how it's able to operate uh, in, in anonymity with regard to the decisions that it actually that it actually comes to and, and how powerful that is. I, I think many of the folks who 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 don't know about a grand jury, again, are being educated about it here for the first time. And then, two, I want you to hear what was what was ruled as a result of their coming together and having looked at all the evidence. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Attorney General. Kentucky Attorney General, this is a statement from Kentucky Attorney General <clears throat> Daniel Cameron. He says this, quote, while there are six possible homicide charges under Kentucky law, these charges are not applicable to the facts before us mm. because our investigation showed and the grand jury agreed that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in the return of deadly fire after having been fired upon mm -hmm. by Kenneth Walker. And he says this, and I'm still repeating his statement. Let me state that again. According to Kentucky law, the use of force by Mattingly and Cosgrove was justified to protect themselves. This justification bars us from pursuing criminal charges in Miss Brianna Taylor's death. He, he continues, the proof is now before us. The facts have been examined and the grand jury comprised of our peers and fellow residents have made a decision. He says this, and I'm continuing to quote from him. He says this, and this is important. He says this, justice is not often easy. It does not fit the mold of public opinion and it is not conform uh, conform to shifting it does not rather it does not conform to shifting standards it answers only to the facts and to the law hmm. end quote hmm. i I, th I thought this statement wow. was very clear and incredibly powerful and again against the backdrop again my goal is not to adjudicate the whole process again or to walk through every facet of the of the case but to simply state based upon what you did which is to lay out for our audience what a grand jury is and how they function and how they operate and how this is a this is a part of of, of what we've known as, as as a constitutional right of, of an american citizen and then to see that that responsibility play out in in this decision that they came to I just think it lends even that much greater credibility to where they landed on the issue. I, I want to put that against the backdrop of what people who don't have all the facts, right. who have not sat through all of the information, who, who, who don't know every facet of the case, who are simply reading through headlines uh, and, and trying to and, and are, and are, you know, are, are, are beholden to specific narratives of the journalists involved, that's where they're getting their news from. But those who sat in the room and paid the price and investigated the, the whole process from start to finish have landed on this decision. And you have believers, Christians, who still are upset, not based upon evidence, but again, as I mentioned earlier, their arguments are based solely upon the emotion of the outcome that they don't like because of someone's ethnicity. Right. That's really amazing. You look at, I don't know how many times we've mentioned the word evidence here so far, Omaha, in the few minutes that we've been discussing this, but the principle of evidence goes all the way back to, in scripture, Numbers chapter 35, verse 30. Mm -hmm. the, this, pr this whole principle of evidence, okay, mm -hmm. and ensuring that facts align with the charges, okay, to either charge or not. In Numbers chapter 35, verse 30, we read this, if anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of witnesses, plural, mm -hmm. the evidence of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. That's justice right there. God is so concerned about the truth. Okay. The justice of God, and I'm going to elaborate on this later on, but the justice of God is first of all rooted in the truth. What is the truth? Okay, not 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 how do you feel? Who who let me let me ask you Omaha. Would you want to be put on trial knowing that your guilt or innocence is going to be predicated upon how the jurors feel? <laughs> no, no way. Who who would want that? We said no. this in the George Floyd episode. Yeah. Who 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 of our listeners regardless of which side you land on this issue, who of anyone listening to me would want to stand trial for your life, okay, on the basis 
of someone's emotions. No, you wouldn't want that. But, but, but we've got these hypocritical professing Christians out there. And the reason I'm harping on these professing Christians is because I'm talking to those who consider themselves to be a part of the body of Christ. Like I said earlier, I expect the world to be hypocrites. But here, here we have, as you just pointed out, Omaha, here we have prof- professing Christians out here, especially these woke Christians, okay, because th- their voices are the, the ones that are primarily leading the, the charge for justice for, for Breonna Taylor, we, especially those talking as if they were, par- they were in the grand jury room. <laughs> right, right, right. T- 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 talking as if they were on staff with the uh, Kentucky Attorney General's office. Right. Talking as if they've seen the evidence for themselves talking as if they were in the apartment when Breonna Taylor was shot. Right, right, right. You know, and I would prefer that those people again, especially many woke black Christians, especially because theirs are the voices that are primarily leading the outcries for justice here. And I put justice in quotes, right? I would that they would all just be honest with themselves and with us and just admit, okay, just admit that you are hateful, prejudicial bigots Mm -hmm. they would be doing us all a huge favor by simply being honest with themselves about who they truly are who they truly are in their hearts which is closet ethnic bigots who camouflage their hatred of white people under a cloak of piety by demanding so-called justice wow and again i put that in air quotes wow you don't want justice What you want is blood, right? Their paradigm of justice, Omaha, looks nothing like the justice of God. And what does the justice that God desires look like? What does God's justice look like? It looks like these two passages of scripture in the Old Testament from the book of Zechariah. First, I want to read Zechariah chapter seven, verses eight through 10. Zechariah seven, verses eight through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus has the Lord of hosts said, dispense true justice okay dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother and do not oppress the widow or the orphan the stranger or the poor and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another that was Zechariah 7 verses 8 through 10 let me pause there for a second Omaha because we freestyle on this the first part of that text that I just read you got your woke Christians out there. They're cool with that. So where, where God says, dispense true justice, practice kindness and compassion. Easter's brother, do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor. They're cool with that part. But, the, but after that semicolon, uh, after that word poor, they're not, they're not necessarily okay with this part where God says, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. We got a lot of uh, woke Christians out there who have devised evil. Mm-hmm. in their heart against these police officers solely because of how God created them in his image with white skin. Mm-hmm. Okay. With a, 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 a more shallow shade of melanin than they have. Okay. They're devising evil in their hearts and they just need to go ahead and admit it and stop being hypocrites about it. Zechariah chapter eight, verses 16 and 17. Zechariah eight, Verses 16 and 17. I repeat these uh, references, by the way, verse, in case our listeners are taking notes. Sure. Uh, so, so that's why I repeat those. Uh, Zechariah 8, verses 16 and 17. These are the things which you should do. Judge with truth, God says. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. And let none of you devise evil in your heart against mm-hmm. another. And do not love perjury all these are what i hate declares the lord that was zechariah 8 verses 16 and 17 god says let none of you devise evil in your heart against another all right so the justice that god desires and requires begins with truth and it ends with truth Mm -hmm. that's that, that, that how you feel about the outcome is totally irrelevant Now, if you know in your heart that the truth is not what you desire, stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to yourself. Just tell the truth. You love perjury. You love hatred. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You love prejudice because what you want is an outcome. The outcome you want is not based on what is true. You want an outcome that's based not on what's, what's, what's the truth, but on your own evil desire to see someone punished, even if unjustly. Okay. What more do you want than an attorney general presented evidence to a grand jury and the grand jury of impartial individuals said, no, there's not enough evidence here to charge these officers with first degree murder and to give them the death penalty as you so thirst after. Mm -hmm. Listen to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18. He who conceals hatred. See, my point here is that I, I want the hypocrites to come out. I would have more respect for you if you just came out and acknowledge what's truly in your heart right. and stop, stop, stop playing games with yourself and with God thinking you want justice when really all you want, you're motivated by hatred. Proverbs ten eighteen: he who can, he who conceals hatred has lying lips and he who spreads slander is a fool. Ephesians four, verse 25. Therefore, laying aside all falsehood, that is all lying, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. All right. So the folks who I'm speaking to right now, you see, you know who you are. You know who you are. You are concealing hatred in your heart and you're not speaking truth to your neighbor. So I know a lot of people listening to me right now are concealing hatred in their heart. And again, Omaha, they know who they are. So again, this is the lane I'm going to be in for the rest of this episode. So you guys can either choose to, to, to push stop right now, or you can continue listening. But what, but what's got me so indignant here is the hypocrisy of these woke Christians out here who are uh, co-opting and prostituting the idea of justice when they know that's not what they want. They want a preferred outcome that's based on the skin color of the victim and the skin color of the offender. Man, come on in here, Omaha. What you got? Yeah, I, I just I just think about what you said. I mean, if you go through and begin asking the question, you know, what would be justice? What what would what would justice in this instance look like? And and I, I've read through a lot of material on this man in prep for the show and over the course of the of, of the case, off and on at times when when you know when the when the flames would fan a little bit higher, I'd pick up a few articles and take a look and. Man, you know, just just like everybody else, probably a little bit more than everybody else, because I know that, that the potential for you and I to perhaps discuss the issue. And so I, I, I listen intently to what people are saying. You know, we want justice for Brianna. OK, what what is justice? And when you right. listen, when you listen to their responses, they're they vary all over the board. Right. Everything from they want more information. They want to hear uh, more, you know, so, some some facet of the case revealed. They want a, a a particular question to be asked as if as if none of these things have already happened right as if as if all of these things are are are, are not what's happening behind the scenes and so what what happens in in most of those cases especially when when uh the attorney general unpacked the the, the report that he did as he began to answer questions the the bar began to move. Let me give you a couple of examples right. of what I mean by that. As 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 he laid out what was what the findings were of the grand jury and the decision that had been made, what what began to happen is as the as the Q and A portion started, the bar began to move. The bar then became well, how many of the people in the jury were black? How many were white? Who who what what was the what was the ethnic makeup? Of of each of the of, of the jurors and and I mean all of this information was was now added to the and, and you know what did he feel as a black man all of these things were added to the issue when the outcome that that many desired was not put into play the the other thing is I, I after that after the um, the events on that day uh, and and the um, uh, the outcome was was determined by the grand jury. What what what'd you have next? You had violence in the street, mm-hmm. right? You you had you had places all over the world, literally all over the world, with with images and pictures of Breonna Taylor. I saw I saw a a a, a uh, an incident. I mean, a, it was a a riot in Germany, 
in Germany, bro. Wow, wow. With a with a picture, they had a picture it, while they were riding, while they were protesting. Of uh, hold, on, it, hold on, hold on, hold on, second, Omaha. Now you said a riot in Germany, as in the country, not Germantown, Kentucky, because I I know Kentucky no. has a Germantown. You, you're no, talking about bro. Germany, the nation. No, bro. I wish I would have held. I wish I would have put. I'll have to go back and look at the at, at, because I, you know you know how we do on this episode. We don't we don't drop stuff without having without having exactly, the receipts bro. for it. Exactly. So 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 I, I definitely want to go back. But th- th- this was a foreign country. Let me state that this was a foreign country where protesters were protesting, where people were rioting, and and they held signs with the pictures of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. So my oh. my, my my point in bringing this up. Is that this is happening all over the world? Like the, the the impact of 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 this this quote unquote movement, if you will, is having worldwide impact. And people are are operating and making decisions not on the basis of all of the facts, but on the basis of of their emotion. And when you ask them, what is justice? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean when mm-hmm. you say justice? What what you come to find is that justice is a word often used, unfortunately, in our day to hide the wicked motivations and evil actions of the lawless. Man. That, that's, that, that's what's happening right now. That's what we're seeing take place mm-hmm. right now yep. in, in, in the culture. And, and I think you make the point brilliantly from the outset of, of, of our conversation. We expect this from the world. Mm-hmm. We do not mm-hmm. expect this from those who, who hold to the idea that, that they indeed believe themselves to be Christians. That is right. not how Christians are to operate. Right, man. Great point. Great point. You know, the 19th century English preacher may be unfamiliar with most of our listeners, but there's an English preacher in the 19th century by the name of Frederick W. Robertson. Mm -hmm. Frederick W. Robertson said this, quote, there are three things in the world that deserve no mercy, hypocrisy, fraud and tyranny, unquote. Now, I mentioned that quote from Frederick W. Robertson because people who are calling for justice for Breonna Taylor, even after an investigation and decision has come forth from the Kentucky Attorney General and a grand jury, are already guilty of at least two of those three. Hypocrisy and fraud. Hypocrisy and fraud. They are hypocrites and that they are exalting themselves above the law and making themselves judges of others. And they are frauds in that they are falsely representing Christ and his gospel. Now, my favorite Puritan, Thomas Watson, said this, quote, when we profess God's name, but do not live answerably to it, we take his name in vain, unquote. That was Thomas Watson. Now, I want to point to another passage of scripture here that is germane to the conversation we're having here in terms of justice. Okay, and I thought you brought up a brilliant point, Omaha, that when, when, when people are asked to define what they mean by justice, mm-hmm. the, the, the dial moves all over the place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. OK, if you don't have an objective uh, definition, an objective standard of what justice is, you don't have a definition. Right. Period. Right. If you're if your construct of justice is not objective, it is not, if it is not transcendent. OK, if it is if, if it is not from somewhere outside of yourself outside of your perspective, outside of your emotions, outside of your opinion, if your definition of justice is not detached from you completely, you don't have a definition because then I can come, I can come right along. uh, I can come right alongside you and give you my definition of justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening. So, so I'm glad you brought that up. I want to point our listeners to second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. We're talking about the justice of God, mm-hmm. okay? We're talking about the justice of God. Second Chronicles 19, verses 1 through 7. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, quote, should you help the wicked? Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? But there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asheroth from the land and you have set your heart to seek God. Unquote. Verse 4. So Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem and went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord 
the God of their fathers. I love that phrase. Jehoshaphat brought his people back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. Verse five. He that is Jehoshaphat. Let, please listen to these next three verses. He appointed judges in the land in all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city. Verse six. He said to the judges, listen to this. He said to the judges, consider what you are doing. For you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful. This is Jehovah, Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, talking to the judges that he's appointed throughout the land of Judah. I'm going to go back to the last part of verse five, verse six. He said to the judges, consider what you are doing. For you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do. For the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. Okay? That was Second Chronicles 19, verses 1 through 7. Jehoshaphat is making clear. To the judges, he admonishes them, consider what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord. This is for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. Listen, in the same way that Jehoshaphat implored the judges he appointed to, quote, let the fear of God be upon you, unquote, that same fear of God should be upon us in seeking the justice of God and not our own brand of spiteful revenge under a cloak of justice. For it says in that text that, that I just read, God will have no part in partiality. Now, when God says he will have no part in partiality, he means what he says. He means what he says. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Deuteronomy one, verses 16 and 17. Then I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen or the alien who is with him. Verse 17, you shall not show partiality in judgment. I mean, verse, when are we going to get this through our thick heads? You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not fear man for the judgment is God's. The judgment is God's. In other words, the outcome belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And whatever that sovereignly ordained outcome is, we need to be content with it. And that's throw out in the streets, burning stuff up, breaking windows, blocking people surrounding people's cars and pulling them out of the cars and, and beating them almost half to death. Okay. We need to, we need to be content with these outcomes, knowing that God is sovereign over these outcomes. Listen, in his book, the bruise read the bruise read the Puritan, uh, Richard Sibbs said this. He says, we must neither bind where God looses nor loose where God binds, nor open where God shuts nor shut where God's where God opens the right use of the key is always successful. Unquote. I want to repeat that Richard Sibbs from the book, the bruised read. We must neither bind where God looses nor loose where God binds nor open where God shuts nor shut where God opens. The right use of the key is always successful. You know, Omaha, as I look at some of the reactions of professing Christians to the decision reached by the Kentucky attorney general and the grand jury, to indict only one of the police officers involved in this Breonna Taylor incident, I can't help thinking that some of those same people, some of those very same people, had they been alive in Jesus' day, would have totally ignored the fact that Pilate said of Jesus, I find no guilt in this man, mm -hmm. and would have been part of that mob yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Listen, 1 Corinthians 5, 17. I have no doubt whatsoever that some of those people, had they been alive in Jesus' day, would have been part of the mob saying crucify him. 1 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creature. 
Now, one of the evidences of that new nature is that we have the mind of Christ. I said that earlier in 1 Corinthians 2, 16. And one of the evidences that we have of the mind of Christ is that we don't judge according to outward appearance. Okay, that's John 7, 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That's part of having the mind of Christ, that we don't judge based on our emotions. We don't draw conclusions. In worst case, we don't condemn anyone based on something we don't know. Like I said, I wasn't there in the grand jury room. Omaha, were you there? By any chance, did you have to be, well, you, did, you, did you just happen to be rolling through Kentucky at the time, through Louisville? Not there. Nope. Nope, not in any way. What you got, man? Come on in here. I, a lot of, lot of thoughts, man, about what you shared. Uh, you know, you, basically what, in light of, of what we're seeing in the culture, is, is an obvious appeal to mob justice. And, exactly. And, 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 and unfortunately, when, when you promote social justice, I call it subjective justice. When, when you promote social justice, what social justice is an appeal to mob justice or, or, or what we're seeing in the streets, which, which is the fruit of which is mob violence. That's what you get when, when outcomes don't align with what our preconceived ideas have the tendency to be. And, and, and what we do in response is we riot. Or, or we burn down cities or, 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 or we call for some form of justice that has nothing, that has no bearing in the evidence of the facts because th there's, there's, no, there's, not, there's not a fact that is presented by which s someone is saying, hey, that's wrong or that's incorrect or they should have considered this. I've been today. I've been. I was preparing uh, a, a message that I that I intend to preach here in, in a little bit, and uh, I'm talking. About, I'm I'm thinking through the issues of social justice. I, I I look and found, man. It was interesting to 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 identify this that this social justice, man. This is this is not new. You know, Fr Frederick Hayek was talking about the the impact of social justice uh, on on the culture. He said this, and I quote: He said, "I am certain that nothing has done so much to destroy the juridical safeguards of individual freedom as the striving after this miracle of social justice." End quote. And I, I, there's another quote that he that he said again. For those who don't know, Frederick Hayek is a Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, economist. Um, he, he received that that award in, in 1974. I, I, I was I was looking through his book Road to Serfdom, uh, as as well as some some other uh, some other light reads, man, and that I'm trying to add to my library. Right. right. Um, he 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 says this. He says, "quote The idea of social justice is that the state should treat different people unequally." in order to make them equal. You know, and, and again, he, he's applying this primarily to issues of economics and redistribution of wealth. But but it but in, in the first quote that that I that I that I presented, he, he, he's talking about it from a standpoint of of legal reforms, right? The 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 idea that that social justice does much to destroy the juridical safeguards, the legal safeguards, and individual freedom as we strive after social justice, which eventually lends itself to what the mob think. This is mob thinking. Think. This is mob thought, and 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 it's in, in appealing to that, especially from a from a viewpoint of of, of calling yourself a Christian. I, I can't think of something more damaging, more dangerous, more damnable than 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 doing something like that, injecting the idea of social justice uh, into the culture, uh, in, into Christian culture, uh, and, and holding the moral high ground. And you said it early on. You talked about pharisaic, phar pharisaicalism. Th that's exactly what we're dealing with, right? Yep. And, and no, one, no one is willing to apply the same standards to their own lives that they're willing to apply to the lives of others. No, no, one, is, no one is looking through the, to, through the issue of justice and examining their own heart and mind and, and coming out and finding themselves wanting in those instances. They're easily able to point the finger at others and, and believing that, that the outcome was unjust, was, was inaccurate, sh should have been different. And again, mm -hmm. none, of this, none of this on the basis of evidence all on the basis of ethnicity. You know, Verge, what you just said kind of reminds me, again, talking about phar Phariseeism and hypocrisy, uh, you know, knowing, and again, I'm talking to professing believers out here, and they know who they are. They know who they are. If you're listening to this and you, it's like that old adage, right? If the shoe fits, wear it. Right. If, this, if, if this hypocritical shoe fits, you already know it. You're wearing it. You're wearing it. 
Okay. I um, was listening to you just then, Omaha. I was reminded of a blog article that I wrote four years ago. Mm. I wrote this blog article four years ago. You can find this article that I'm about to refer to at my blog site at deacondarrell.com. That's Daryl, D-A-R-R-E-L-L, deacondarrell.com. I titled this article, So You Want Social Justice? Be Careful What You Ask For. Mm -hmm. Be Careful What You Ask For. And in that article, I quote the late Jerry Bridges from his book, The Gospel for Real Life. Jerry Bridges, in The Gospel for Real Life, in the chapter titled Justice Satisfied, said this, quote, all of us have failed miserably to obey God's law. We disobeyed in Adam and we have every day of our lives disobeyed in our own persons. Therefore, all of us stand condemned before God's law, fully liable to its curse and punishment. But just as Jesus fully obeyed God's law in our place, so he suffered its full penalty in our place. In the same way that Adam was our representative in the garden, so Christ was our representative on the cross. He bore the full brunt of God's justice that we should have borne. He received the full punishment we should have received. Through his representative union with us, Jesus assumed our obligation to perfectly obey the law of God and obeyed it to the letter. Through that same union, Jesus assumed our liability for not obeying the law and paid that liability to the utmost. He fully and completely satisfied the justice of God on our behalf as our substitute, unquote. That was Jerry Bridges from his book, The Gospel for Real Life. Now, why did I quote Jerry Bridges there? Because I want to take our listeners to Luke chapter 23, and I want to remind every professing Christian out there who seems to think that they have a right to be indignant about what the grand jury's decision was in this Breonna Taylor situation, that they have a right to be upset, to be angry. I want to point you to Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 39. I'm going to read Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 41. Luke 23, verses 39 through 41. One of the criminals, this is where, where Jesus is crucified. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him. This is hurling abuse. One of the criminals on the cross alongside Jesus is hurling abuse at Jesus. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, the other thief, the other criminal answered, and rebuking the other criminal said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are not, we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. That was Luke 23 verses 39 through 41. What I want to focus on here is what the thief said. He said, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. Now, I want to say to anyone listening to me right now who happens to fit this hypo hypo hypocritical category that I've been uh, emphasizing in this episode. If in, if in fact you are a truly regenerate Christian, never forget that because of Christ, you are not receiving what you deserve. You are not receiving what you deserve, which is a full onslaught of the wrath of God for your sins against him. Come on, man. Come on, man. You're not receiving what you deserve. Mm -hmm. And yet you have the temerity. Right. You have the temerity to cry for, quote unquote, justice in a situation you don't even have any input or or exposure to. Mm -hmm. The only the only situation you have experience and exposure to is the sin that you committed against a righteous Holy God, which is deserving of an eternity in hell. But because God took the initiative to rescue you from that. What right do you have to condemn anyone to condemn that police officer or that entire group of police officers to condemn the attorney general? Who had the nerve to abide by his sworn oath of office? But no, 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 no. Because Breonna Taylor was black 
and the bullet that was fired to ki- that killed her was fired from the, the gun of a, a white police officer. Uh-huh. That gives you justification, does it? That gives you justification. You think you have justification to uh, after an impartial, fair, constitutional due process, you still think you have the right to condemn that police officer. Now, what if that were you? Right. What if that were you? What? No, imagine yourself. Imagine yourself had God not sent his only son to die on a cross in payment of your sin debt to him. Imagine where you would be, where you would be. You would have no advocate whatsoever. None. Apart from Christ, you have you would have no hope standing before the judgment seat of God. Mm-hmm. None. Now think about that seriously. Think about yourself. Uh, apart from Christ, apart from the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Right. You would be that thief on the cross who said we are suffering justly. Yes. We are suffering justly. We are suffering justly. I just want to put some context out there for you. Okay. The situation involving this police officer has been adjudicated according to the Constitution. Okay. The attorney general there fulfilled his oath of office. But we had, a, I think I saw a video on uh, Mojave uh, black Live, a female Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter leader, who compared uh, the Attorney General in Kentucky to uh, to, be, to being no better than than uh, blacks who helped sell slaves into slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that? You, did you, did yeah. you see that? Yes. Yes. But see, see that that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about here. So, so again, I just want to say again, I would have much more respect. For anyone who's listening to this, you just come on out and be honest and just tell the truth about really what's in your heart. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And I, I, Vern, I'm going to throw it over to you real quick, but I want to, I want to quote something from the Westminster Confession here. Mm-hmm. Now people might say, well, what in the world does the Westminster Confession have to do <laughs> with the Breonna Taylor situation? Well, it has to do with it because it speaks to God's providence. It, it speaks to God's sovereign providence. See, see, what we what we don't have in situations like this, Verge, is we number one we don't have a proper biblical homodiology. Right. We don't have a proper proper biblical theology because we totally remove the providence of God right. over situations like this and think we need to handle it ourselves. Right. Right. As 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 if we're uh, proxies for God in exacting what we would say with our mouth is his justice, but in our yeah. heart is really my justice. Yeah. We, we've got, we've got to help God out. He's, he's we, got, we got to help. Yeah. His, his, his hand is, is a little too slow, a little too short. So we get, we got to help him out. A look, little look, look, look too slow. Right. But see, see, so, so we want to lynch these, these police officers, mm-hmm. but we don't want to put ourselves on the other side of that, uh, other side of that noose. Mm-mm. And so well, what is, what if this was me? So I want to quote from the Westminster confession, chapter five on God's providence. Westminster Confession says this, chapter 5 on God's providence, God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence, Mm -hmm. according to his infallible, excuse me, according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy, mm-hmm. unquote. It says to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Now, what, what I quoted the Westminster Confession there in light of this verse in 1 Timothy 5, 24. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. The sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Mm. The sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Now, 
when you pair First Timothy five twenty four with what I just read from the Westminster Confession, what you have is a is a a a a, a proper biblical theodicy. You have a proper biblical understanding of the doctrine of evil. When mm-hmm. evil occurs, it is God in his sovereign wisdom, as, as the Westminster Confession says, to the praise of his, the glory of his wisdom has sovereignly allowed that evil to occur. Right. I said to occur, okay, to occur to the praise of his glory. And given that God is sovereign over these uh, situations, in situations of evil, when there are situations of evil, objectively dem- demonstrated and proven in instances of evil. According to first, uh, first Timothy five twenty four, God in his providence, he's going to deal with some of those sins in this life. He's going to mete out and exact his judgment and his justice in this life. But in God's providence, not all of the evil will be dealt. He will, he will not choose to deal with all those sins in this life. Some of, for some sins, the judgment is going to follow after this life. Okay, so in other words, let God be God. Right. Okay, when, when, as we said earlier, God is sovereign over the outcomes of situations like George Floyd, like Breonna Taylor. As a Christian, as a truly regenerate Christian, we need to be content that in, that God, in His sovereignly sovereignty, has foreordained this outcome. And who am I to complain? Who am I to be angry? If there is an injustice, according to God's standard, I have to put that caveat there. If there's an injustice, according to how God's word defines justice and injustice, God is going to make sure that either in this life or the next, he's going to be vindicated. Uh And that needs to be our motive and our impetus for seeking justice. The justice of God is that God would be vindicated, not me. Not me. Mm-hmm. I don't have a personal vested interest in the fact that Breonna Taylor was killed outside of the fact of what we said at the very top of this episode, that she was an image bearer of God. She was a fellow image bearer of God. I don't care what her sex was. I don't care what her ethnicity was. I, I couldn't care less about any of that. But again, as Christians, we have the mind of Christ. And we must discipline ourselves to be discerning so as to respond in the spirit, not in our flesh. As it said in John 7, 24, you don't judge with on outward appearance. This was Jesus talking, by the way. Do not judge based on outward appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That means you you judge righteously as God defines righteousness and what is right. Okay, verse anything, man, bro. There was so much in that I had to take notes. I started. I grabbed a pen and a sheet, and I started writing down a number of different things based upon what you shared in that section. I want. I want to start with something that uh, that, that you mentioned earlier, and and you were really kind of unpacking the hypocrisy of m- many of the social justicians who are really upset, uh, primarily on the basis that a, a black woman was was killed at the hands of a white officer. I, I remember this past week, and, and I know you're not gonna mention it to our listeners. I wanna mention it so that they go back and see it. Uh, earlier this week, you had an opportunity to, to share the stage with one Dr. John MacArthur uh, at Masters University. Um, and, and during that time, which I thought you did a masterful job do, uh, walking through some of the really challenging issues around ethnicity, race, and you, and you guys kinda did a Q&A, you answered a number of questions. One of the things that you did that I thought was really, really smart was you asked, uh, you know, how many of you know the name of, of Breonna Taylor, of George Floyd, of, you know, of, of you know, all of the different, you know, all the different people that, that, that have, have, you know, Michael Brown have been, been shot or something has happened to them. And then, then you asked the question about a, a young girl who had died, uh, un, you know, unexpectedly. Uh, by those who had, had shot her. What was that young lady's name? Yeah, her name was Sicoria Turner. Sicoria Turner was an eight-year-old black girl who was murdered, shot in the back uh, on the um, uh, 4th of July weekend uh, in Atlanta, on the southeast side of Atlanta. I think mm-hmm. she was in the car with her family. They were pulling up to a Wendy's restaurant. Uh, they had just exited off of a freeway. They were uh, obviously uh, pulling over to get something to eat. And uh, she ends up dead. 
Sicoria Turner is her name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I thought about that, and, and you, you even went on further to kind of walk through uh, over, over the course of the holiday, uh, su- summer holiday, how many, how many blacks were shot and killed in, in Chicago over the course of a weekend that, whose, whose names uh, we, we can't record. We don't even know. You and I do because we actually did, we actually did an episode uh, where I walked through a number of the names of the people mm-hmm. that, that had yep. gotten, gotten, gotten killed uh, over the course of that, of that time frame. I, I, I also thought about what, uh, what, when you were talking earlier, you know, you were talking about theodicy. You were talking about the problem of evil and its impact, and 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 how people want to see evil eradicated. The reality is, what we don't recognize is that if evil is is if God completely eradicates evil, you and I would be gone. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Uh, every, every single one of us would be done and over with. We 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 seem to we seem to have a blind eye to our own sinful condition, uh, but but we're clear eyed and wide eyed toward the sin. Of, of everyone else, and, and God calls that hypocrisy. We've spent so much time talking about the fact that God God is not involved in judging uh, based upon partiality. Uh, God, God does not judge that way, that, that, his, that his justice is impartial, uh, that, that, that his justice is objective, it's fair, it's, it's, it's a part of his nature, it's who he is. God is just. And so when I think about issues like Breonna Taylor, like Michael Brown, like all the names of Ahmaud Arbery, like all the names of the people that, that, we've, that we've talked about, and the response to those issues, the question that I think needs to be asked is, who, who are people more upset at? Or, or, or why are they upset? Are they more upset that, that God's justice was not, uh, was not adjudicated? Or are they more upset that, that their, their personal uh, vengeance uh, mm-hmm. it, it has has not has has not been ex- exercised, and and mm-hmm. I think I think I think that's what's at hand. People don't feel like their personal vengeance has gotten exercised, right. and so that's what they're concerned with, and that's what you see them do uh, out in the street. And uh, I I just thought all of that the, the the ground that you covered really again. I had to make some some just some mental notes so, to, so that we can go back and. And, and maybe recover some of this ground. I know this is more of a freestyle episode, and so uh, we're just kind of shooting off the hip a little bit on, on, on some of these ideas. But I think those are important to mention for our listeners to, to, to consider. I completely agree with you there, man. Thanks for mentioning that, too. And uh, I'm going to wrap up with this, man. I, w- I want to take our listeners to Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus 19, verses 15 through 18. I want to wrap up with this passage, Omaha, because undoubtedly, see, this is, you mentioned the word, the word receipts earlier. <clears throat> One of the things we've gained a reputation for here on the Just Thinking podcast is the amount of time and effort that we put in and doing our research. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put in tons of hours to get ready for a one to two hour episode, sometimes two and a half. What, but the, the length of the episode is, is not the point. The, the, the point I'm making is that uh, t- to a great degree, we make sure that we keep receipts because we know we have our haters out there listening to us mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. looking for loopholes. Right. <clears throat> looking for loopholes, looking for a reason to accuse us of uh, uh, some violation of their subjective standard of right and wrong. Right. Okay. Right. So they'll hear an episode and say, well, you guys didn't talk about this or you, you guys didn't say anything about that or you, just, you guys don't care about justice. Right, that's that's right. that, that's that, that's the one accusation that we probably get the most whenever we're doing an episode that encroaches upon the social justice, racial reconciliation space, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or anything of that nature. You guys don't care about just oh yeah yeah we do, we care about it quite a bit. We care about the justice of God. I don't really care about your justice, listener. I really don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care about your subjective definition or construct of justice. I really do not care. That's the kind of justice I don't care about. I care about the justice of God. Virgin, I care about the justice of God and helping equip you, if you are a believer, if you're truly regenerate, to apply God's definitions, God's principles, God's precepts to help you shape a biblical theology of what justice truly is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, we care about justice. We just don't make an issue of the skin color of the victim. We don't make an issue of the skin color of the perpetrator because regardless of the ethnicity of the person who's dead, they're dead. Right. A, a black person is no more dead than a white person 
when a white person is shot and killed or when a Hispanic person is shot and killed or an Asian or a Middle Easterner. They're dead. Okay. But I want to wrap up with this passage from Leviticus 19 verses 15 through 18. This one goes out. I sound like a a, a radio DJ. This verse goes out. (laughs) This is for all my haters out there who want to tell us at the end of this episode, well, you guys don't care about justice. Then y'all go acting white again. Now, listen, listen closer to this. Leviticus 19 verses 15 through 18. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. Verse 16. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Mm-hmm. Verse 17. This, here's the money verse. This, this is the money verse for all our haters out there. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. You shall, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19 verses 15 through 18. God says, yes. So here's, here's the point in verse 17. God says, you may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. So what God is saying there, going back to John 7, 24, judge not based on appearance, but with righteous judgment. Yeah, we call out an injustice when it has been proven to be an injustice Mm. as God defines it. So yeah, we care about justice. We care about injustice, but not so much that it's so subjective that it causes us to sin in our heart against someone that we might perceive committed the injustice. God says, you shall not take vengeance. He said, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. This is why I called out these hypocrites at the beginning of the episode. Some of y'all hate, have hatred in your heart, but you're disguising it. You're masking it. You're camouflaging it under your outcries for justice. You don't want justice. You want revenge. Leviticus 19, 18 says clearly, God says, you shall not bear any grudge against the sons of your people. See, th- th- these verses in Leviticus 19, verses 5 through 18, these remind us, verse. Uh, and, 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 hey, strike this up as a pet peeve if you like. Fine, <laughs> but 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 one thing I'm convinced of is that we have many many uh, professing Christians in the church today who have no real appreciation for the exalted way of life that a Christian is supposed to live. When the gospel called, when God, as according to First Corinthians one thirty, First Corinthians one thirty says, "By His doing, that is by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus." When, when, when God calls you to faith in Christ, when God uh, works in your heart, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, when he, call, when he saves you by grace through faith, through no work of your own, from that millisecond on, you are called to a level of life that is above and beyond anything that the world can devise including loving your neighbor mm-hmm. without asterisk. There's no, there's no asterisk here in Leviticus 19, verse 15 to 18. There are no asterisks in these verses. Right. God says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, period. But we have no appreciation, verse, for the, 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 the high standard the high standard to which God calls us to live mm-hmm. as followers of Jesus Christ. And we need to get that right. We need to get that straight. Yeah. We need to get that straight. I'll close with that, man. You want, you want to, yeah. anything you want to say and then you can close us out, bro. I'm, I'm yeah. Out. Yeah. No, you know what I, man, I think, I think all of that is, is spot on. We've got, we've, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about Matthew chapter seven, right? That, that, uh, yes, and, thank you. You know, I'm I'm thinking about the, the the hypocritical judgment that God calls us to to not do, uh, that we must first take the log out of our own eye, uh, so that we can see clearly to take the speck out of our uh, out of our brother's eye. But 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 what happens in this instance is self examination takes place, 
right? S- self-examination, yes. examining one's yep. own life, one's own heart, and recognizing that, you know, were it not for the grace of God, there go I. Thank you. Uh, were, were, were it not for God's grace, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm the hypocrite. I'm the, I'm the one who, who's, who's doing things wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm the one in, involved in a, in a, in a drug deal gone bad. I'm the one uh, trying to, trying to fend for my life at the door mm-hmm. of, 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 of someone who's trying to take my life. I, I'm, I'm all of those people, because I, I suffer in the same human condition that, that all of us. Uh, encounter in the fallen world in which we live. Thank this you. A, yep. This is a this is a fallen world in which we live, and and for us to stand on our high horse with our arm on our sh- on our on our hip, uh, looking down upon everyone else and how they operate, uh, acting as if we're we're somehow above it all. Man, how hypocritical is that? Exactly my point. How hypocritical is that? And 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 we we as believers we should know better. Um, I, it was this morning, bro. I was listening to uh, John MacArthur. He was actually walking through Philippians um, chapter um, two, uh, where where he talks about. In fact, I want to I want to open up with that. In fact, I I want to close with that. How about that? yeah? Let's do it. Let's do it, man. We freestyling. Go ahead, do your thing. Yeah, I just I I, I was just listening to to him navigate that this morning, and and he talked about how in this instance, when it comes to humility. Uh, we have the example of Jesus, and and in his example, um, we, 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 it, it's such a mind blowing example. God, who is who is who is who is deity, who is the, mm-hmm. the second person of the Trinity, condescends. Mm-hmm. He comes down, takes the form uh, of a baby, right? It takes the form of a servant in, in human flesh. Uh, and, and becomes obedient even to the point of death. Let me let me read this here. Uh, uh, Philippians chapter two, verse three. It says, "Does no, do, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves." which is yours in Christ Jesus. And, th- and then he provides the example of Christ Jesus. We need to have this same mind, you Christian, Amen. you believer, mm-hmm. you person who professes Christ. This is the mind that you need to have, who Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a mm-hmm. thing to be grasped. Mm-hmm. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He took the form of a servant, though he being God humbles himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result of that humility, God himself, God the Father himself, exalts him and then gives him a name that is above every name. What you have in our current climate, man, is Folks, folks ain't waiting for God the Father to exalt them, man. Right, right, man. They, come on, man. They come are, on. They are, they, I need to cue, I need to cue the mascot on that one, bro. I need to cue they, the mascot they, right they, there. They're, they're not waiting Can for you God say that to again, exalt bro? them. Yeah, they, they, we are not waiting for God to exalt us and man, give us a oh name man. above man. every name. We, in every instance, when God encountered His servants in the Old Testament, He would change their name. He took Abram yep. and made him Abraham. But but guess what? Abram waited for God to give him a new name. Man, come on, we, bro. We we got we got folks ain't waiting no more. We, we got folks we got folks who don't have time to wait on God. They they, they are gonna they're gonna make justice theirs. They're they're gonna adjudicate yep. the law according to their own their own subjective idea of what justice actually entails. Not not having the the um, omniscient view. The, the omniscient view of God for, for, for all of eternity. There's a reason. You talked about this earlier. There's a reason why God allowed this instance to take place as it did. Yep. Man, there's a, on, there's a reason. We wow. have no idea what that is uh, and, 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 and aren't in a position to know. That doesn't negate the hurt and the pain and, and all that. We, we, we addressed all of those issues, the hurt, sure the did. pain. We talked yep. about all of that and how difficult it is to navigate. But the reality is, at the end of the day... God is God, and and He is in charge, and it is important for us to bring the gospel, and that's what we tried to do during this episode. We tried to bring the gospel into conflict with the culture in the instance of of the of the of the death, and I won't say untimely death. I'll say the death of of Breonna Taylor. That's that's where we are, and and that's what this is. And my hope would be 
that those who've been impacted by what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, what they're feeling, will, will, will take the light of the gospel uh, and examine their own lives uh, and, and come away recognizing that they have a need for a Savior, that they are indeed a sinner and that they need a Savior. Man, I want, I want to close out with praying for the family uh, of, of Brianna Taylor. Let's do it, the, man. Let's do that. For the officers involved and, and uh, for, all, for all those things. So let's, let's do that as we close. Father God, we just give you thanks and praise. We're thankful that, that you uh, sent your Son uh, on our behalf. Uh, and that Jesus, that you condescended, uh, that you came down and, and lived a, a perfect life, died a death that we rightly deserved uh, on, on our behalf, and that, that you uh, became the payment uh, that, that we could not pay. Uh, my, my prayer would be that those who are under the sound of my voice would, would bow the knee, would repent of sin, and place their faith in Christ. I, I do want to take the time uh, to lift up the family of Brianna Taylor, and uh, I, I pray for their comfort. Uh, I pray for their peace. More importantly, I pray that they come to know the Prince of mm-hmm. Peace, Amen. Uh, that, that they come to have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to the extent that, that, that they recognize that there's a hope that's coming, that, that, that hope may not be found necessarily in this day and time and, and what they're experiencing through the loss of Brianna Taylor's death, but that there is a hope in Christ, uh, a hope that passes all understanding, a peace in, in that passes all understanding, a hope that, 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 that lands eternal. I pray for the families of the officers involved. I cannot imagine mm-hmm. uh, with what's going on in our culture, what their families are, are having to endure as a result. And, and I pray that all of what they are dealing with, uh, the, the, the officers who, who, who uh, the, the, the grand jury found uh, didn't, didn't their, their uh, situation didn't arise to the level uh, necessary for any further action. And those officers for whom are going to continue to go on through the process, I pray that they too, like the family of Breonna Taylor, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray for the continued ongoing strength of the of the uh, Kentucky uh, Attorney General. I, I pray for him. I pray that he will be he will continue to be emboldened. That he'll be that that, that his that his mind will stay uh, stay focused and laser being focused on the truth, and, and that he indeed does have a saving knowledge of you as well. I, I pray for Jamarcus Glover, uh, for mm-hmm. Kenneth Walker, mm-hmm. uh, for these young men who, who who are caught up in this 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 chaos. That is, the, that is the world in which we live, that is the world in which the decisions they're making have, have placed them in. I, I pray, Lord God, that you in some way, shape, or form would draw them unto yourself by your spirit, that they would come into contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, and as a result, that they would turn from sin and place their full faith in you. And I, I lift up all those who would, who, who would hear this particular episode, that they indeed, uh, if they don't know you, uh, that they would be, that their heart would be softened as a result, and that they would come to a saving knowledge as well. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Appreciate that, Pastor. Appreciate that heartfelt uh, prayer, bro. Anything else you want to say to our I, audience, bro, before you take us out? Absolutely, man. I just want to encourage those to to take this particular episode and share it far and wide. I think it. I think I. I. I, I my hope would be uh, that God would use it to, for for His glory and that that uh, He would be glorified. That that the warnings that we laid out. Uh, in this particular episode would be heard, not from a standpoint of any emotive aspect in our lives, but from, but from what the gospel says, from what the gospel declares and requires, from what the word of God requires in the life of the believer, that we, not, that we be impartial in our judgments and that we, that we show and, and point people to the truth of God's word. And so that, that would be my hope and prayer. And, and with that, man, I just want to encourage our listeners to tune again with us next time uh, to the next episode of the Just Thinking Podcast.